Hello everyone, I'm Sina Basar, a PhD candidate at the University at Buffalo, and today I'm going to talk about uh, an ongoing project, which is the resilient seismic retrofit of non-ductile code deficient reinforced concrete shear walls. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the experimental study we had. Uh, so my advisors are Dr. Okomos and Dr. Aleti, and this is a collaborative project between University at Buffalo and the University of Alabama, and this project is financially supported by NSF. Uh, so as a brief introduction, I would say non-ductile reinforced concrete shear walls uh, are might in need of seismic retrofit. Past earthquake, especially those two happened recently in Chile and New Zealand, show that non-ductile reinforced concrete shear walls might undergo severe damage. Of those, we could refer to crushing of concrete in the web or in the boundary element, buckling and fracture of vertical reinforcement, and premature shear compression failure. And it's obvious that the last one is the most catastrophic one and must be prevented. So it's apparent that these walls are in need of retrofit. So in case of retrofit, the retrofit methodologies could be divided into two separate groups. So the more traditional way of retrofit is, to, is based on a strengthening reinforced concrete shear wall or other reinforced concrete components by using steel concrete or FRP jacketing. So by doing this, one could increase strength, stiffness, or ductility of the uh, structure. But on the other hand, our proposed retrofit strategy is based on the concepts of weakening and self-centering. By weakening, uh, we mean that uh, some parts of a system are removed or weakened intentionally to make sure we can achieve the desirable force or displacement capacity. And uh, looking at the left-hand side, graph, weakening usually results in a lower acceleration demand, but higher displacement demand. And self-centering is the ability of the system to return to the original position upon unloading. So the force displacement relationship of self-centering structures is usually elastic, nonlinear, and uh, self-centering could be achieved by having restoring force. And that restoring force could be in the form of either uh, a gravity load or post tension in the strand. Uh, so our proposed retrofit method, as I mentioned, is the combination of selective weakening and self-centering. So in this study, selective weakening is done by cutting the base of the reinforced concrete shear wall. So it's gonna be a full cut. So it means the whole concrete and a number of vertical bars are to be cut and the cut shape is gonna be non-straight. And for this system, self-centering is provided through using external unbounded post-tension tendons, and the energy dissipation for the system is provided by leaving some of the vertical bars uncut. Those bars are usually concentrated at mid middle of the section, and by hysteretic yielding of those bars, we are going to have energy dissipation. So essentially, by doing this retrofit method, we are converting a monolithic cast-in-place wall to a hybrid rocking ball. And the last step of this uh, retrofit method is to protect toes of the wall from possible damage due to rocking. And this can be done by using C-shaped steel plates at uh, toes of the wall. So to design our specimen, we uh, considered the three stellar building, which was located in Roland Heights in California, a risk category of two site class of D and important factor of one where the uh, assumptions made for the purpose of design, the response modification factor was set to five, which is for conventional reinforced concrete shear walls uh, in frames, and the seismic weight was 4,800 kips. So for the design, you can see the footprint of the building here, and for the design, we consider the frame consisting of a reinforced concrete shear wall and a slab uh, column gravity framing in the shorter direction. And the design was done using equivalent lateral force procedure per ASC 716. So our pre-retrofit specimen, which was our benchmark specimen as well, was a monolithic cast-in-place wall, which was not compliant with the requirements of ACI 318. So it had some flex trial design issues and some shear design issues. So in terms of flex trial design, the spacing of confining bars in the boundary element, the extension of boundary element into the foundation, and the spacing of transverse rebar in the web were not compliant with the requirements of ACI 318. And for the shear design, we tried to maximize shear demand to capacity ratios so that we get significant contribution from shear 
at the point of failure. And our post retrofit specimen was a hybrid rocking wall, which was designed per requirements of ACI ITG 5.1 and 5.2 documents. These documents require hybrid rocking walls to have <clears throat> sufficient self-centering and energy dissipation, and to have sufficient self-centering in the form of low residual drift, we could balance moment contributions coming from axial load and uncut bars. And for to have sufficient energy dissipation, ITG document requires to have at least 12.5% uh, of relative energy dissipation ratios. So this, this uh, energy dissipation concept is going to be introduced later. So our pre retrofit specimen, in this slide we are looking at the configuration of our specimens. Our pre retrofit specimen had an axial load of 6% of the axial capacity of the wall, which was the gravity load coming from the tributary area in the building. And the gravity load was imposed to the specimen by using four post-tensioning strands concentrically placed at mid-length of the wall. For the vertical reinforcement, we used a uniformly distributed number five bars and number three bars were used for transverse reinforcement and confining bars. And uh, our post-retrofit specimen had an additional of 4% axial load to make sure that we achieve the self-centering capacity. And as you can see in this figure, 50% of the bars, the bars in the boundary element were cut, but the ones in the mid middle of the section were left uncut. And uh, to make sure we don't have sleep at the base, we made the trapezoidal cut shape at the base so it's non-straight. And we also used confining the steel plates at toes of the wall. So to be more specific about the retrofit details, so we use the shear key at the base to avoid possible shear slip. We also debonded uncut bars for 12 inches to make sure we avoid early fracture due to stress concentration for rocking systems. And we also used external steel plates for two reasons. The first one was to protect toes of the wall from possible damage. And the second one was to uh, compensate for the non-ductile detailing of the boundary element of the original wall. And there was a gap between the steel plates and top of foundation to make sure that we are not going to change the strength and the stiffness of the system and we just uh, change the ductility of the system. And the video in the right hand side shows different components of this retrofit strategy. So our test setup uh, is like the figure, like what we see in the figure in the left hand side. We are gonna impose, uh, we, we imposed a cyclic displacement control loading protocol, which was compliant with the requirements of ACI ITG 5.1. And each uh, loading cycle was repeated three times and the uh, lateral load was applied through a static hydraulic actuator and our post retrofit specimen was able to sustain the drifts up to 4%. Here are test videos. So as you could see, our pre retrofit specimen in the left hand side is gonna bend when we like impose lateral displacement because it's like a cantilever wall. And the post retrofit specimen in the right hand side does more rocking type of things. You can see the gap opening at the base when we impose the displacement on the top. And in the larger cycles of displacement, this gap opening is even more evident. Uh, so from now on, we are going to uh, focus on the experimental findings. The very first thing to look at is the force displacement relationships. As you can see in this graph, the failure drift was increased from 2.5% to 4%. Here, the failure is defined as a displacement at which the force dropped by 20%. Actually, for our post retrofit specimen, as you can see here, the force did not drop. But because of the damage we saw at the base, we decided to terminate the test. And the peak force also decreased from 80 kips to 64 kips, which was 20% decrease. And in terms of self-centering or low residual drift, you see that when the wall is unloaded in the positive direction, the wall shows great self-centering capability. But in the negative direction, it shows uh, it doesn't do a good job as it, was, uh, as it did in the positive direction. The reason is due to the low consolidation of uh, concrete when the concrete was poured. And the next thing to look at is to look at the backbone curve and failure progress of the 
uh, pre-retrofit and post-retrofit cases. We defined four different uh, failure indices, uh, namely cr first cracking, first flex jaw yield, first shear yield, and first bar fracture. And both table and graph shows that the, the retrofit method could successfully delay uh, all uh, failure indices except for the flex shell yield. And here at this slide, we are looking at the damage to the valves at the end of the testing. So the end of the testing for the pure retrofit case is going to be 2.5% drift, while uh, it's going to be 4% for the post retrofit case. As you could see, the boundary elements of the pre retrofit specimen. Uh, has pretty much destroyed and we have extensive crackings either in the form of shear or flex child cracks and the cracks started from the base and it go all the way up to the top of the specimen at 2.5 percent drift but for the post retrofit case we had a lower number of cracks and those cracks are just from the uh, top of foundation up to the uh, roughly half of the height of the wall we also had uh, some crushing of concrete in the web uh, above the shear key. Uh, so another parameter of interest to look at is the energy dissipation capacity of the system. Uh, so we had we used two different energy dissipation measures. The first one is the relative energy dissipation ratio per ACI ITG document, and that's the area under closed loops of force displacement divided by a parallelogram defined by the initial stiffness and the drift of the cycle of interest. And uh, the other one is the very well-known concept of equivalent viscose damping ratio. So as I said previously, ACDI ITG requires 12.5% energy dissipation in the form of relative energy dissipation ratio. And our post-retrofit specimen was able to make it except for the last two cycles, which was a little bit lower than 12.5%. And uh, on average, uh, comparing post-retrofit case to the pre-retrofit case, we had 40% decrease uh, in the energy dissipation using both measures. Uh, the other parameters to look at was uh, residual displacement and secant stiffness. So as I was mentioned previously, uh, the self-centering is measured using residual displacements. The wall did a better job when uh, it was unloaded from positive direction. We had uh, an average of a 53% decrease in the positive direction, while it was 20% in the negative direction. And uh, second, the stiffness was nothing by, uh, uh, but, uh, force, uh, but force at maximum displacement divided by the maximum displacement. And on average, we had 20% decrease in the sec second stiffness. The other parameter of interest for us to look at was the plastic hinge height, because past researchers have argued that uh, hybrid rocking balls have lower plastic hinge height compared to pre retrofit bonds because of the so gap opening at the base. Our experimental program also verifies this. And if you compare the, the two figures together, you see that the plastic hinge height was reduced by roughly 50% comparing the post-retrofit case to the pre-retrofit case. Uh, we also used eight uh, load cells at the top of each strand to monitor the axial load. Uh, so we started with roughly one for the kips, which was 10% of axial capacity of the wall. Uh, as an initial force. And because of low consolidation in one side of the wall, when we were uh, loading uh, the specimens in one direction, we had loss of pre-stressing force because of the early crushing of concrete we had. And uh, the other thing to mention is that we haven't yielded uh, none of the strands. Uh, to wrap up, I would say that we uh, experimentally investigated the feasibility of retrofitting a code deficient reinforced concrete shear wall by converting it to a hybrid rocking wall. Uh, we used quasi static cyclic testing for our pre and post retrofit specimens. Our post retrofit specimen was more ductile, it could sustain up to 4% drift. It had uh, more self centering capability because it had. A really low residual displacement, especially in the positive direction. We had a smaller but adequate energy dissipation ratio because we could satisfy the requirements of ACI ITG document. We have shown that we could delay first cracking, first 
shear rebar yield and first vertical bar fracture while the flexural yield was happening at the same time. And uh, at the end, we had uh, more concentrated cracks near shear key, uh, but the total number of cracks were lower and also the cracks were narrower. At future work, we are going to test one more poster trophy specimen. So the, the global things are going to be the same, but we are going to change some different details, some small details about the poster trophy specimen. We are going to develop detailed 3D finite element model as well as 3D uh, simplified 2D finite element models. Actually, we have developed them and we published some papers on them, but uh, they need to be calibrated based on our experimental results. We're going to perform nonlinear responses analysis and possibly incremental dynamic analysis and at the end the goal is to develop fragility functions for this system. At the end I want to acknowledge National Science Foundation for the financial support to this project and also Dr. Andy Liu from Engelkirk Structural Engineers who helped us with uh, uh, designing the building and I would like to thank you and I'm open to any questions. Thank you, Sina. It's a wonderful talk. Um, we can take a few questions. Um, I will read the first question that was actually posted in the, now it's in the Q&A box. Um, the question is, how difficult was it to debond the bars? Did you duct tape them before pouring concrete? Uh, so yeah, what we did is that, uh, if I go back to that slide, what we did is that we used the plastic sheeting around the bars and we used zip ties to make sure that the plastic sheeting is in place. I mean, I used like white tape here to close the gap over there. So it's maybe not uh, evident enough, but in the actual practice, yeah, they could just uh, demolish the concrete at the base and try to like plastic sheet the bars, use plastic sheeting to wrap the bars. And it's gonna, be debonded. Thank you, Sina. 